Now, the question that fascinates me in my group is how we understand other people. How is it that we wake up in the morning, we look at our partner's face, and when she's happy, we feel so elated? What I'd like to do with you is look at this image of a Syrian boy and feel what you are feeling. If you're like me, his anguish starts to really penetrate you. You feel really sad yourself. I can almost sometimes feel my own mouth open in an almost desperate sob. I can feel after a while even pain in my own throat as if I'd been crying. Now the question is, what is it that connects us so strongly to this photograph and this boy? Now I hope that by the end of my talk, you will never look at this kind of photograph quite in the same way again, because you'll understand how powerfully you are connected with other people. Now, the classic model of how we process faces like that when I started my work was the following. People assume that the first thing you do is some visual processing in your brain that allows you to really see the stimulus. Then the idea was that there's some kind of somewhat mysterious logical thought process that allows you to go from the image to what the person is feeling. So those would be rather abstract rules, like the presence of a tear indicating that he must be sad. Now, once you've done in this model all of the logical thinking, then you can add a layer of appropriate emotional reaction, and maybe you can start to plan actions that would be appropriate, things like wanting to help him or feeling sad yourself. But the important thing is that in this traditional model, the actual understanding of what goes on in the other people does not involve your own actions or emotions. They come after the fact. Now, this is what I like to call the hamburger model, because it basically relegates your own emotions and the vision to relatively boring processes like bread. And the real juice and meat of it is hidden in this middle layer of thinking. Now, we all know that hamburgers are not very good for us, and I'll argue that this hamburger has been particularly bad for our understanding of how we relate to other people. And it came to me while I was working on the activity of neurons in a part of the monkey's uh, cortex that is called the premotor cortex. Now, what you can put is you can put an electrode in that part of the brain, you can amplify the activity of a neuron so that you now hear in a loudspeaker popping sound each time the neuron is active. And if you do that, the first thing you notice is that all of the neurons there involve when the monkey himself does something. So if, uh, if I'd been giving a piece of fruit to the monkey, there'd be activity at the moment the monkey grasps the food. Now, there was nothing new. The real surprise came from uh, hearing that these neurons were becoming active as well, while the monkey that I'm recording from wasn't doing anything, but was simply seeing me grasp something with my hand or with my mouth. And I'll show you that in a little uh, cartoon animation again. So you're going to listen to the popping activity of the neuron in the monkey, while the monkey will be grasping a piece of fruit from me first, it's the motor activity, and then later on while the monkey is seeing me grasp. Now, the amazing thing about this finding is that for the first time we realized that the monkey's own actions would not just come after he understood what we did, but was actually part of the machinery active each time he was seeing me grasp. So with a system like that, if you'd see me take this bottle of water, mm, take a nice, satisfying sip, you would not just see me do it, but you would internally replicate the drinking as if you'd be drinking yourself. Now, of course, most of us are not really interested in monkeys, so one of the questions is whether humans do the same thing. So in humans, what we do is we put them in a scanner, we measure their brain activity, while we ask them to do certain actions, like taking soup out of a bowl. We can then map all the brain regions that are active when you yourself do something. 
then we can as well show you movies of somebody else do similar actions. And we can map now in blue the brain regions active while you see somebody else's action. And then I can show you in white the region that, like the neurons in the monkey, are regions that are part of your motor programming, but that become reactive each time you see somebody else perform a similar action. Now, of course, I started with the boy with the most salient thing were his emotions. And now I'm showing you action. So how about emotions? Well, the tricky thing is that emotions are not easy to study in a lab because I can put you in a scanner and ask you to be sad for 10 seconds while I'm measuring your brain activity, but it's not going to work very well. So what we ended up doing was putting people in the scanner with an anesthesia mask on their face. I ask you, why do I get an anesthesia mask? But you tell them they'll find out soon enough. And indeed, we then start to puff really unpleasant smells like rotten eggs or, you know, or rancid butter in them. And that works pretty well. So we had to take one of them out because he started vomiting. But for the other ones, we could now repeatedly measure what parts of the brain were active while the person was feeling an emotion himself. And you see that here in red. Now, we could also show them somebody else going through a similar emotion, map those areas in blue. And again, we saw that basically you recruit your own emotions each time you see the emotions of others. Now, you might wonder, are we all equally empathic? Well, there are differences amongst us here in this room with some people crying more when they go to the movies, for instance. And what we see is that if you scan people that report being more empathic, these activities are stronger. But we were as well interested in the real extremes of empathy. So we got interested in trying to see what would happen in psychopathic criminals. So one of the ideas is that they lack empathy and that the reason why they do terrible things to others is because while they hurt someone, they don't empathize with his pain and that takes away the barrier towards hurting others. So we put people in the scanner and showed them movies in which they could see in the scanner somebody else experiencing pain. So it'd be here somebody getting his hand pinched, pinched again, or then having his finger twisted, or being slammed. Now, when we did that with healthy volunteers, we found very robust activity in all the systems I've been telling you about, in particular here in this emotional part called the insulin. When we did the same with the psychopathic criminals, this activity was really much reduced. So that fitted a bit the idea of a broken empathy. But then my wife had the idea, let's scan them again, but this time we'll ask both groups to try and empathize uh, as much as they can. When we did that, all of these differences disappeared. And that created a much more interesting notion of psychopathy, not as being incapable of empathizing, but just choosing sometimes not to empathize and sometimes to empathize. And that, of course, for your moral behavior has a huge impact because imagine that you're interested in having sex with someone. In all of us, the idea of raping is completely unpleasant because we would feel all the misery we impose on someone else. For them, if they have this goal of having sex, there's no reason to turn on their empathy. And therefore, they will not share the misery they inflict. And this will take away this moral barrier. And of course, this inspires new ways uh, for therapy as well that we're now trying to explore in animal models. But if we put all of that together, what we saw was that while we were looking at this boy, not only does our brain process visually what we see, and unlike the hamburger model, we don't just engage in abstract logical thinking about what happens to this boy. Instead, our brain transforms this picture into a representation of our own actions, our own sensations, and our own emotions. So with all of that together, of course this boy has such a strong impact on us because we stop to just see him, to see his misery, and we start to be him, to feel his misery deep inside of us. And I think once we realize that, that our brains are wired in that way, we can not only understand 
why a single image like that can really change completely the public perception of a war, because it allows us to not just know about the war, but to really feel how miserable a war is. And that, of course, stirs in us an honest and deep wish to change things. But on the other side, it is why it gives us a very positive message, which is the fact that humans are not these completely egoistic animals that just struggle for survival. We are actually wired to connect deeply with other people, to work together, to be a society. And it is in this spirit that I'd like to really thank all the wonderful people in my lab that make that work possible, in particular my wife that co-directs the lab with me. So you see, I'm just kind of the Pierre behind the Marie Curie. <laughs> I've had the ability to work with amazing mentors through the Marie Curie in, uh, in the actions, but I'd like to thank the European Commission as well, not just for funding this kind of work, but what they do every day, they go to work to transform our vision of a united Europe into a reality. And what I'd like to really thank them for is to create this world of peace in which we as scientists can really tackle the frontiers of knowledge without being hindered by the frontiers of nations. Thank you. Don't go away yet. Uh, any questions for Christian based on his speech? Any hands up? Anywhere? Yeah, we've got one here at the front, and then we'll follow by the lady in the red in the middle. So we're going to start here with Brian, over here. Here in the front. And then we'll go to the lady in red in the middle. I'm Brian Cahill of the Marie Curie Alumni Association. Um, does your wife's idea lead back to the hamburger model because she's asking people to think about having an empathic response and so to, to impose kind of the logical step in between um, kind of uh, the emotional reaction to the uh, picture. Now, I think it's a very interesting question. The point though is that this logical step doesn't come between you and the emotions. It actually is a mechanism that operates outside of the basic loop that connects you to uh, and your emotion to the stimuli and it can up and down regulate this loop. So uh, of course our work doesn't suggest that there is no cognition, no logical thinking involved. Actually we all have a whole panoply of mechanisms we can use to up and down regulate empathy. The first thing is, if you don't want to uh, be exposed to these negative feelings, you can as well not even turn on the television. That's one example where, through logical decision making, you can basically modulate this mechanism. But the important thing is that you still have a direct connection between the other person and your emotions, but that direct connection can be regulated from, uh, from your own decision making. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, speech. And uh, well, I think my, partly my question was uh, answered because uh, I wanted to ask you how we choose uh, whether we will show empathy or not, and how and what are the mechanisms for the uh, psychopaths not to do that. So. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you're going to have to invite me again in about five years because this is exactly what we're trying to do right now. We have a whole uh, animal research line where we're looking at empathy in rats, actually, to try to really look at individual differences in how empathic they are and then really dig deep to understand whether the difference lies in the way that the brain connects vision and emotion or whether it lies with mechanisms that up and down regulate this. And that we have some reason to believe that as well in rats you have a bit the equivalent of psychopathy, which is that certain rats will value their own reward more than pain to others, whereas other rats will value the pain to the other more than their own reward. So I hope that in about five years I'll have a, a decent answer to your excellent question. Okay, we've got time for one more question. So it was first hand up here at the front. As an educator, I'm interested in the growth mindset. Um, I wonder what consequences has your research for us as educators teaching empathy? 
Yeah, so I think actually there's a, uh, there's a very good colleague of mine, uh, Jami Ozaki, in, uh, in California, that precisely looks at that question. He tries to prime people either with the notion that empathy is a fixed entity or that empathy is something you can work on, that you can modify. And he seems to find that just priming people to the fact that you can really work on your own empathy breaks free a bit this uh, border that, for instance, toward outgroups, you're less empathic, and you can then really get people to, to become more inclusive in, in the groups that they empathize with. So I think this is a, a, a part of research that is very alive right now, and I would really welcome uh, as well ideas from you on, on how to really bring that forward. Okay, thank you very much, Christian.